Tonight, we welcome Dr. Jesse Greaser, Assistant Professor of English. Dr. Greaser is a sociolinguist who specializes in discourse analysis, geosemiotics, and sociophonetics. Currently, her research agenda focuses on the use of African American English, AAE, in expressions of the intersectional identities of race, place, and social class. She's writing a monograph currently which looks at the use of AAE in constructing place identity for residents of a historically African American neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Her other research interests include language diffusion on the World Wide Web, especially discourse in fan communities. She's a member of the Linguistics, Linguistics Interdisciplinary Program Committee and supervises linguistics undergrads as well as English undergrads and graduate students. Let's give a warm welcome to Jesse Greaser presenting tonight, Linguistic Diversity in the Classroom. Take it away, Dr. Greaser. All right, thank you all very much and thank you for attending. Um, I see lots of familiar faces, um, both from UT and outside. So um, it is my honor to have you all here this evening. Um, I'm going to mess with what Angie just said, uh, which is that at one point in this talk, I am going to ask you to unmute yourselves um, and I'm going to share my slides uh, and, um, and away we do go. second. No, I'm not. I'm not going to share the end of my presentation. I would like to share the beginning. I think that's a good place to start. All right. Um, <laughs> so I was about to talk about being a tech enhanced teaching fellow. You all can put whatever laughter you would like to put in the chat. Um, so <laughs> I'm Jesse Greaser. Um, as I mentioned, I'm an assistant professor of English linguistics in the Department of English. Um, I study African American English and the scholarship of teaching and learning and linguistics, as well as all of the things that Angie just talked about in online language. I am, despite all appearances, uh, a faculty fellow for technology enhanced teaching at the university. And so I'm actually going to demo a couple of large class Zoom teaching techniques in the first little bit. Uh, if you are listening to this while you're walking the dog or cooking dinner or whatever, no judgment. That's what I usually do during these things too. But if you happen to be at your computer and have your keyboard handy, uh, there are some opportunities for you to participate. So, ready? Here's a tough question. Fire off what you think of when you think of grammar into the chat. Everything is welcome. What is it? How do you feel about it? Rules. Shared rules. Structure, oh, some people took some linguistics. Conjugation, logic, love it. Writing, an old woman, elderly lady. <laughs> Silently correcting your grammar. Co-articulation. And no phoneticians snuck into this talk. Compliance, right? So I see lots of things about rules, old kinds of things. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a grammar question, pop quiz, sorry. I told you this wasn't a regular talk. Let's think about the English reflexive pronoun. And if that word is causing you to break out in hives, well, you brought this on yourself. And that's exactly what it is. The reflexive is just the pronoun we use when the patient of an action or the receiver is the same person as the doer, the, the agent of the action. For example, you brought this on yourself. So let's start with the first person pronoun, drop it into the chat. I brought this on. Excellent. All of you seem to have passed kindergarten. Um, so let's keep building. For speed's sake, um, I'm actually going to ask you to unmute if you don't have background noise. So if you don't have a barking dog or something like that, we brought this on ourselves. ourselves. You brought this on yourself. All right, plural. You brought this on yourself. 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 ourselves. Ourselves. All right. Tell. You might you might notice that here in East Tennessee, we also get y'all filling in the hole in the pronoun paradigm as a second person plural. 
<laughs> so you get y'all selves. I am teaching you. <laughs> and finally, she brought this on herself. 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 Okay, you can go ahead and remute. So you all aced that grammar quiz. Um, so if we try to figure out what's going on here, something is getting added to self. What is it? My, your, her, our, your, really obviously in y'alls, right? Because we actually get it marked with uh, punctuation. What's the name for that form? You can drop that in the chat if you want. So my, we, your, I see possessive. No idea, what is this called? Possessive, possessive. Theo, I was expecting you to say genitive because you do Greek. Right. So we've got a possessive form here, right? Um, so the genitive, if you've studied Latin or Greek and are being a show off, right? So maybe that's it, Theo, you're just not showing off, right? So that allows us to make some predictions. The possessive form of he is his. And the possessive form of they is there. So these turn out to be predictions that don't match standardized English grammar. I've marked them with a percent sign because we actually don't have a sign in linguistics for this thing totally follows the grammatical rule, uh, but for some reason the standardized version doesn't recognize it. But notice that the versions we like better in academic English don't follow the rule we just set. It's the object case instead, him and them. And notice that there's another third person plural reflexive that is perfectly grammatical in some varieties in English, like African American English, they selves or they self. So this brings us to a working definition of grammar. Grammar is the underlying system of rules which govern linguistic structure. What do I mean by that? Well, let me tell you a story. My older brother and I both went to bilingual elementary schools. He took German. I took Chinese. He traveled to Germany every few years starting in seventh grade. And he came home from one of those trips and gave me an order, make the light out. It was odd and at the time I didn't know any German, but here's what was happening underneath. In German, you get mas das, mas das licht aus, which translates as make the light out. He took the English words, ran them through German grammar. So that's grammar. It's the box in your head that makes the words fit together in a way other people can understand. Put the wrong words through the grammar and you get garbage. Here's another fact about grammar. Grammar applies to whole languages and also varieties of that language. What do I mean by that? Here in East Tennessee, we are in close contact with a variety called Appalachian English. Appalachian English has the ability to do what we call a prefixing. We can stick an A onto the beginning of certain kinds of verbs. So take a second and think about this one just to yourself. A building is hard work. He is a building a house. He likes a hunting. He went to hunting. And add your a prefix and see which one, whether you like A or B better in each of these sets. I'll give you 20 seconds or so because you should run this as quickly as you can. The child was charming. The child was very charming. So probably most of you have enough intuition to have gotten something like this. We like, he is a building a house. And probably we're gonna get, he is a building a house because of the phonology of Appalachian English. He went a hunting better than he likes a hunting. If we were to really play this out, you'd notice that what you're attending to is <clears throat> you want the verb form, not the noun form, not the gerund form of that verb. You also want it without an adjective preceding if it has an auxiliary verb. You want it without a preposition preceding it. And lastly, you can't attach it unless the stress is on the first syllable. That's 
grammar. It's this system of rule governed things that happen to language. Grammar arises from speakers using their language and it changes over time. Here's a great example of this from the current age. If you spend time online, you know that grammar, you can has it, is the right title for this slide. You know that the lolcat's grammar rule for verbs is something on the order of use a different form, which usually means marking everything for third person present singular, because that's the only verb form that we mark in English with an inflectional affix, right? So I run, you run, they run, we run, y'all run, but he, she, it, singular, they runs. Okay. Importantly, what linguists think of as grammar does not happen like this. There is no Charlton Heston. There is no mountain. There are no tablets. What many of you think of as grammar though is prescriptive grammar. That's stuff you were tested on on the SAT, prescriptive grammar. That does come down from on high, sometimes completely arbitrarily. More on that later. And prescriptive grammar comes from the process of language standardization. Standardization is a metalinguistic process which reflects social differentiation of power. It's about who has power in a society, who has access to be the ones who are doing the prescribing, or who are the people that many people want to be more like. Let's take a quick lesson from the history of English. So if you want a deeply informative and breezy read about the history of English, check out David Crystal's The Story of English. It's big, totally worth it. English as we know it is actually mostly based on London English. That was the English that got exported to all the English colonies, including here, because it was already the prestigious variety in England. It became exported right around the time that English was starting to standardize. A major tool of that was the printing press. Prior to the invention of the press in the 1400s, there was no such thing as standard spelling. Individual typesetters did whatever they wanted. For instance, some Flemish typesetters um, in those very early days just up and decided that since the word ghost, which was spelled G-O-S-T, looked a little bit like its Flemish counterpart, they'd just add an H. Why not? We also accidentally invented the printing press in the middle of a sound change. So we were all eating mate, and they spelled it that way with the letter E, which of course stands for the sound A, which you know if you know Spanish, right? H-O. H E. And then while we were busy standardizing M E A T, the vowel moved and became E, and well, the rest is literally English history. So, spelling, a stalwart, standard, unchanging thing, actually isn't a very standard. And neither is much of English grammar. In fact, a lot of English grammars come not out of people passing on the correct forms down to other people, but actually out of people who were desperate to get a correct form and have someone tell them what to do. Uh, and so people with some power and the ability to print invented some rules in order to appease people's linguistic insecurity. What do I mean by linguistic insecurity? Well, let's try another experiment. I'm gonna show you a picture of something and I want you to type the plural of that thing into the chat. Don't hit enter until I tell you to and try not to edit your answer. Just put the first thing down that comes to mind. Ready? I want the plural of this. Hit enter. All right, I see octopuses, octopus, octopi, octopi, octopuses. Octopi, do I see any oct, I, I got no octoped. No, wait, I got octopode. Excellent. Uh, that technique, by the way, is called waterfall. Um, a very excellent large class technique. Okay, so what's happening here is we have a thing that doesn't come from English. And by all accounts, it's an English word now, but it wasn't always. So we end up with competing plurals for it. It really ought to just take the English S by now, uh, but it doesn't, probably because we don't really love the syllable puss getting an S. If you don't know why, please go home, ask your parents. Uh, but these competing plurals come to mean more than just competing plurals, as evidenced in this little piece of viral fun from Tumblr, which I'll read. 
So when you don't know anything about linguistics, well, the plural of memorandum is memoranda. Why can't people just get it right? When you know a little about linguistics, well, the plural of memorandum should just be memorandums because it's how people naturally say it. Memoranda is just prescriptivism. When you know a lot about linguistics, oh my God. So certain English words borrowed from Latin and Greek have competing plural forms with one form using the English plural S and the other using a borrowed Latin or Greek form. Do you know how crazy that is? A language borrowing inflectional morphology from another language. And here the two competing plural forms have become markers of education, expertise, and social class. Isn't that incredible? And when you have a degree in linguistics and DGAF, memorandables. I'm in the memorandables camp. This, however, captures a significant sociolinguistic fact. Languages, language differences become imbued with social significance. What do I mean by social significance? Let me give you an example from my sociolinguistics course. I have a couple of students in this uh, chat and they are going to recognize this exercise that I just made them do last week. I make my students make language judgments about the voices of these two people. They don't get to see their faces. They hear a voice that sounds female, probably black, rings the bells, professional. Then they hear a voice of a younger man, kind of hillbilly, backwoods. They get asked about their age and their occupations, their political affiliations. And here's what they usually come up with. Democrat, Republican. But if you know these two faces, then you know that on the, on the left is Omaros Omarosa Manigo, just Omarosa, former aide to President Trump. And on the right is Trey Crowder. He's a hometown boy, grew up in Salina, Tennessee, now lives in Knoxville. He's a comedian who goes by the moniker, the liberal redneck. So when we listen to voices and hear all the accent features and syntax, that's language structure, that goes along with someone's voice, we're forming all sorts of ideas about who they are, where they're from, what they believe in, and what they're capable of. Language ideologies capture the links we make as hearers between social characteristics and language features. They don't capture objective linguistic reality. They capture what we're thinking. Think about how you feel about hearing somebody from deep in the Tennessee Hills saying he has an idea versus hearing Prince William say he has an idea. Same feature, different ideology. Here's another fun example. I can't go no further. How do we feel about this speaker? I won't make you type this into the chat. I'll save you the embarrassment, but you're probably putting all sorts of associations on her. Maybe less educated, maybe she's black. If she's white, she's probably from the South. And if she's from the South, she's probably from the sticks. Well, she's not. She's the product of me putting an apostrophe into this quote. This is actually Celia from Shakespeare's As You Like It. She's the daughter of a Duke. What changed is that we changed our ideology about who gets to use negative concord, which you may have heard as multiple negation or double negation. The structure didn't magically become less linguistically valid. The grammar didn't change. Our feelings about it did. So a quick recap. Grammar is the underlying system of rules, which allows us to recognize a structure as belonging to a language. Standardization is a metalinguistic process which reflects social differentiation of power. Language ideologies capture the links between social characteristics and language features that we make as hearing subjects. This allows us to go forward and think more critically about this variety you've probably heard about, talked about, and you might even have on your syllabuses or assignments. Standard English. So now it shouldn't be that surprising that the elevation of one variety as a standard is a reflection of our language ideologies about its speakers, not its linguistic properties. 
So Dennis Preston, who is a linguist who works on perceptual dialectology, uh, has talked about two models of the way that people think about what language is. So the folk theory and the linguistic theory. The folk theory, uh, which is the way that most people think about language, there's the language. And then underneath the language, we have good language, right? this thing that we're all aspiring to. Then underneath that, we have sort of ordinary language, right? Like we all live in a state of original sin. We are somehow all deviating from whatever this good language is. And those deviations, like some of them are relatively patterned. We call those dialects and other ones are just errors. It's a very top-down approach. Linguists think about this differently. We think about it from the bottom up. We think about the individual linguistic practices of particular speakers and each of those practices coupling together based on how similar or different they are from the practices of the other people around us um, into dialects, those dialects becoming together to be part of languages. And this actually could just keep extending, right? Because we ask questions about, well, what, what makes a dialect versus a language? That's way too much for this talk. Uh, but that this is much more about how these pieces fit together um, from the bottom up. But the top down is the way that we often talk about language, the way that we often think about language, uh, the way that we're encouraged to think about language uh, from the courses that we took from kindergarten on forward. They exhibit standard language ideology. And standard language ideology, which comes from a linguist, uh, Rosina Lippi Green, in her book, Language Without uh, English with an Accent, standard language ideology is a bias toward an abstract, idealized, homogenous language, which is imposed and maintained by dominant institutions and which has as its model the written language. We think of standard English as the thing that we write. But standard English actually comes from, is drawn primarily from the spoken language of the upper middle class. In my Structure of Modern English course, one thing I ask my students to do is to define standard English and then if they want, come up with a new name for it. One of my students several years ago, who's now completing her PhD at Arizona State, gave me my absolute favorite name. She named it Unicorn English, because the thing is, we all basically agree on what a unicorn is. There are definitely things that if they aren't present, not a unicorn. Doesn't have a horn, not a unicorn. Or if they're present, definitely not a unicorn. If it's a dog, not a unicorn. There are subtle differences though, right? Mine might have a rainbow mane, yours might have a white mane, and we can disagree on those little subtle things and still agree that we have a unicorn. Fundamentally, however, despite all of this agreement, unicorns don't exist. Standardized English, <laughs> unicorn English. We agree on it, mostly, it doesn't exist. Inoue, um, paraphrased in Flores and Rosa, uh, Undoing Appropriateness, which is a fantastic article um, that everyone should take a look at. Little quote here that standardized English should be conceptualized in terms of the racialized ideologies of the listening subjects, rather than the empirical linguistic practices of the speaking subjects. It's in the ears of the beholder, not the mouths of the speaker. And because we as the hearers are the ones who are making these sorts of judgments, we use our understandings of the world, who has power, who doesn't, who's considered good, who isn't, to judge other people's language in a process called the principle of linguistic subordination. And the principle of linguistic subordination holds that the language of subordinate groups will be seen as linguistically inadequate. In other words, the language rankles not because the language is wrong, but because the wrong kind of people use it. Let's grab another quick example from the interwebs. This is another popular meme among the I speak gooder English than you crowd. I often ask my students to think about who's supposed to be characterized by the idea of speaking Walmart. Um, I get all sorts of horrifying answers. Well, linguists had something to say about this and this meme got rewritten. No, you may not ask me a question. I don't know what metathesis is. I don't know what you mean when you're asking me to defend the idea that prescriptive linguistics is correct linguistics, but 
I've come to assess my self-worth based on socioeconomic status and believe that poor people are inferior. And I've noticed they use the word acts more and I'm terrified of being mistaken for one of them. So this policing is about policing the undesirable characteristics of the speaker, not their language. A tiny aside is that this whole process comes from the old English word axion. Um, so the original form was actually closer to ax. The two forms competed throughout the history of English and they continue to compete. Uh, but now that we've decided that the ask version is the more prestigious one. So, okay, what do we do with this information? I know, we'll tell them that it's business English. All right, I am like calling my colleagues out of their names right now. So this is one argument I hear from the mostly enlightened. And I ain't gonna lie, this is way better than it's just wrong English. This is a step in the right direction toward teaching our students to interrogate situational uses of language, toward developing an idea that they have multiple linguistic repertoires, but it overlooks the ways in which we make intersectional judgments about what is professional. For instance, one thing that a lot of business presentation classes might focus on are fillers, that thing you do when you pause for a moment in your speech. So obviously, if you're the kind of person who lots of newspapers would call the greatest orator of our time, this is not going to be a problem for you, right? Uh, I don't think we've ever done this before. This is an excellent segment, and you folks uh, thank your lucky stars you're here tonight. It's time for the Barack Obama uh count. Let me, uh, now let me repeat that. <laughs> Barack Obama uh count. Right. Are you ready? Yep. Here we go. All those things uh, override uh, a guilt by association. Uh, 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 some of these issues uh, to talk more fully about uh, 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 with full documentation that uh, there's nothing I think there's no doubt that uh, 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 it has been in the past. Uh, uh. Yeah, he makes a good point. So, why does that work? Why is he not undermining himself in the way that we might tell people, well, this is unprofessional? The question we might want to ask instead is not what is business English and when do we use business English? But why does business key into white, rich, northern, and male? Now we're getting somewhere. Okay, so people have to go between different repertoires. Fine, we'll teach about code switching. Great, use your home language at home, use your school language at school, and we'll teach you how to navigate between the two. Awesome, except the idea of code switching still codifies the idealized set of linguistic practices of the white speaking subject. Again, here I'm, uh, turning back to Flores and Rosa. Um, it also inscribes standard English as social fact. It just takes as a given that standard English is a thing that we are teaching students about um, rather than teaching them to interrogate these differences. It's still deeply rooted in ideas of appropriateness, which position white upper class varieties as unproblematically better. So your school variety is the thing you're moving towards. School is more prestigious than home. And so we are instantiating school English as not a problem. You see this reflected in the words of teachers who have even been trained in this, who are been trained to think about this these way. So even though he speaks in a non-eloquent way, he's really smart. My assumption about people who speak this way is that they're from a lower class and are uneducated. I cringe when I hear my students speak like that. It brings out the grammar Nazi in me. It's from a really recent book um, by April Baker Bell at Michigan State. Ultimately, it reifies the relationship between linguistic practices and upward mobility by viewing this as objective rather than ideological. It also does another thing. It ignores the fact that the home variety is often more complex than the school variety. 
There was a study into a particular grammatical construction of African-American English that was conducted at UMass Amherst by Janice Jackson, who was at the time a PhD student and is now a speech language professional. And I'll let her talk a little bit about this project. So basically you simply tell the kids a story like this. Cookie Monster is sick today and not eating cookies. Okay? Um, Elmo is eating cookies. You know, um, Ernie only eats cookies on his birthday and well, cat, cats can't eat cookies. Then you simply ask them, who'll be eating cookies? Now, if you're a general American English speaker, the only answer you can get is Elmo. Because when you, that B in your mind, if you're a general English speaker, there's only one form of B for you to go to and that's tit. So it has to be is, am, our word. So if I say, who be eating cookies, you're gonna say, Elmo is eating cookies. But if you really understand that I'm actually not asking you who is eating cookies, I'm asking you who habitually, iteratively over time eats cookies, the answer is Cookie Monster, even though he's sick in the bed and there's not a cookie anywhere near him. And it was really interesting to me that little five and six year old kids actually could do this with I believe over 80% accuracy. So I'd say who be eating cookies and they'd say Cookie Monster. He ain't got no cookies right now. So what Jackson is getting at is a particular feature of African-American English. Um, African-American English has two additional possible forms for what linguists call aspect. It's a separate part of verbal morphology. It tells us about the ongoingness of something. And standardized white varieties of English are actually deficient in this regard. They only recognize two aspects, perfect and progressive. So you can get I run in perfect aspect or I am running in progressive aspect. And note that aspect is different from tense. I was running is in past tense, but still progressive aspect. The running was ongoing, but it happened sometime before. In AAE, B marks the habitual aspect. What is the usual state of affairs? So Cookie Monster, B eating cookies. He's usually eating them. He's usually the one who eats them. You can't say Cookie Monster is eating cookies right now. That's ungrammatical. That's why you get that asterisk at the beginning. You'd get is here, just like in standardized white English. If standardized white English had habitual B, you would have been tested about it on the SAT. Do you use is here? Do you use B here? It's that complicated. One other aspect that we hear around Knoxville is completive, which indicates that something is well and thoroughly finished. Cookie Monster done ate them cookies. And this is part of both AAE and Appalachian English. Okay, so you've learned about grammar. Hopefully you bought into my argument that standard language ideology perpetuates subtle forms of racism and classism. And now you're probably going, great, Jesse, what am I supposed to do? Here you go. All right, well, step one is don't stop here. <laughs> Purple pens are great, but it matters what you're writing in the margin, no matter what ink you write it in. It helps to begin from a knowledge of the varieties you might encounter. A quick blitz through some of the features of the two most marked varieties you will commonly hear on our campus, uh, minoritized varieties, African-American English and Appalachian English. We have a number of features of both the sound, the word formation, and the sentence formation system of African-American English. Things like final consonant deletion, you'll get west side, or final consonant devoicing. An African-American English child who hears the word pick has both the thing that you play the guitar with and the pink animal with the curly tail that oinks um, to choose from because that g can become a k. And regularized substitutions like fa for tha, where you get tooth and birthday. There are a number of aspects of word formation. So you've already seen the regularization of the pronoun paradigm, like his self, um, and things like he run instead of he runs. You get habitual be and completive done in the aspect. We get embedded question non-transformation. That's just a really fancy way of saying we just stick the whole question into the sentence as it was. So he had asked her, did, he, did she come with her friends? We get things like stressed been, I've been married. It doesn't mean that you've gotten divorced. It means that you are married and you are so married and there is marriage that has just been happening since the beginning of time, you've been married. And also things like negative concord, we ain't want none and of course ain't itself. 
Around here, we also hear Appalachian English. And in Appalachian English, you're going to hear aspects of the Southern vowel shift, especially the pin pen merger. So you'll have some students who go to the University of Tennessee because those front lax vowels um, merge before any nasal sounds. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and they merge together. We get things like monophthongization of I before R. So you get far instead of fire. Um, a prefixing, which we looked at before in word formation. Strong verbs and weak verbs uh, being regularized. So you'll get something like I note it. Lay regularization. So lay down instead of lie down. Uh, perfectly grammatical in Appalachian English. You get, again, complete of done. Oftentimes C for saw. So I seen 15 horses at the show and also pretty productive use of negative concord. So you've armed yourself with some knowledge. How do you put it into practice? First, don't obscure the agent. I make all my students get rid of proper and correct and good. These are words that don't belong in an anti-racist approach to talking about language. They obscure who it is that has decided that this is good and what the very social, very human judgments are that are behind this evaluation. You can also replace standard with standardized. There's a lot more room to talk about a noun form of a verb. Standardized, well, who's doing the standardizing? Well, now we can talk about who's doing the standardizing. Privileged and minoritized also does a lot of the work of indicating that these are social processes and not linguistic ones. You can interrogate form. Assign writing that's being written in minoritized varieties. If you aren't in linguistics and you don't have people full on writing academic text in minoritized varieties like we do, we have people who write um, academic work in African American English, you can still compare writing about the same topic for different audiences at different levels. So as, assign a journal article about polymerase chain reaction alongside BuzzFeed explaining the coronavirus tests. Ask your students to interrogate the differences in language. Ask your students about their language choices. They're experts at moving between different audiences. They know a lot more about their language choices than you think. Reflect on their own speaking and writing. How do you make choices about your communication? And explicitly teach unusual genres. And by the way, this includes email. Email is an unfamiliar genre for most of our students, but we still think they should somehow learn it by osmosis. They don't, you need to teach it and teach the kind of language choices which might be made. Some assessment strategies. The first is backward design. Many of you have probably heard about it. Many of you are probably already using it or some aspects of it. It's also known as understanding by design. And the idea is that you begin with the end in mind. What's your objective? How are students going to show that they've met that objective? And how will you measure that success? And then what role does writing, grammar, structure play in that? You may find that it ultimately does not play as big of a role as you think because you'll be assessing the situational effectiveness. Things like how well is the argument made? How well does my student enter into the academic conversation by using sources? How well did they demonstrate their class understanding? Those sorts of questions end up driving the assignments and the assessment that you're making. You can push this a step further by rubricifying. Uh, rubrics hold you to the agreement that you made with yourself about the importance of the parts of the assignment. So if the argument is really important, it's going to take up a big portion of your rubric. They're the result of and the process of good backward design. They also keep you from overemphasizing prescriptive adherence to standardized rules. I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm actually pretty harsh with my students about spell check, for instance. I don't know who of you out there are telling students they shouldn't run spell check, uh, but my students seem to have internalized the idea that spell check doesn't fix all your errors as never use it at all. Uh, for the love of all that is holy, all of us should run spell check. <laughs> if you present me an error that would have been caught by spell check, you drop to the developing level in my mechanics and proofreading portion of my rubric, which is equal to about a 75%. But that portion of the rubric is usually only between five and 10% of the whole grade because I'm not teaching spelling and proofreading, I'm teaching sociolinguistics. So it keeps me from overemphasizing parts that I don't mean to overemphasize. If you want to take this a step further, you can assess using ungrading. 
Um, so this is a, a backpack of strategies that focus on process and completion instead of ranking students against one another. Um, you can use fewer gradations, complete, incomplete, pass, fail, um, strong, satisfactory, weak, although the three um, can sometimes tend toward grading on a single standard. You can have your students collaboratively write your rubrics, ask them for self-reflection, peer review, self-assessment. Um, one of our graduate students in English gave a great talk about ungrading a week ago. Um, I live tweeted it under my Twitter at Jess Greaser. You can hit her up on Twitter as well at Megan von Bergen. So invite your students to the table. Ask them about their own practices. Ask them what matters about their language. Ask them about their choices and evaluate language choices as differences. Um, include different varieties, include different registers. And finally, explicitly teach about standard language ideology. So these are some of the first year outcomes for, uh, outcomes for first year writing from the writing pro Council of Writing Program Administrators. And you'll notice they talk about some of these things about choices, structure, understanding genre conventions, understanding how to negotiate variation. But what this is missing, the thing I would love to see is something along the lines of recognize language standardization processes as ideological, racialized social con constructs, and learn to interrogate standardized varieties as such. So have the hard conversations. Ask, help your students recognize language as a force of institutionalized oppression interrogate standardized English and where it comes from and who it reflects, interrogate the writing norms of your field, authenticate your students' choices, and assign writing as appropriate that reflects non-white, non-mainstream approaches to language use. A handful of resources that I'm going to blitz through and will offer a link to. Um, three great books on African-American English written for general audiences, Spoken Soul, probably at the top of this list, we have an ebook at the library by John Russell Rickford and Russell John Rickford father son team. Geneva Smitherman, um, who is one of the queens of writing about black culture and the role of language in black culture. Um, her book, Black Talk, and also Talk in That Talk and uh, Word on the Street. And dealing with racial prejudice and uh, in the age of post Ebonics, um, Beyond Ebonics by John Baugh. On Appalachian English, we have a book hot off the press edited by Kirk Hazen at West Virginia. Um, and it is Appalachian Englishes in the 21st century that just came out. The University of South Carolina has also recently launched their Appalachian English website where you can find all sorts of wonderful resources about Appalachian English, redo that ah prefixing test um, and learn many more features about this variety and who speaks it um, and where it comes from. Uh, and we are one of the places it comes from. Two relatively recent books on anti-racist literacies. Uh, you heard me quote from Linguistic Justice by April Baker Bell, um, just released in 2020. And also uh, Django Paris and H. Samuel Leem's Culturally Sustaining Pedagogies um, for thinking about how we teach and learn in a way that promotes justice. So thank you all so much for your audience. I'm already seeing some fantastic questions in the chat and I'm looking forward to taking more. Thank you so much, Dr. Grazer.